Any health-related information on the following show provides general information only. Content presented on any show, by any host, or by any guest should not be substituted for a doctor's advice. Always consult your physician before you begin any new diet, exercise, or training program. And thank you for listening to The Whole Care Network. Welcome to Healing Ties on the Whole Care Network. On Healing Ties, we're creating a life to love after caregiving ends by sharing stories and resources and being with awesome people like you. Now that caregiving has ended, let the healing ties begin. Here's your host, Chris McClellan, the Bowtie Guy. Well, greetings everyone. It is Chris McClellan, the Bowtie Guy, for another episode of Healing Ties. I am so happy to to bring on Liz O'Donnell from Working Daughter. Liz, I've got your book right in front of me. We're we're going to be very informal on this podcast, but it's just great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you. And you don't have to cut away to me. I could listen to you all day. So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. I, I've acquired another sister today. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, you know, Liz, it's kind of it's a, a, a perfect example about this vast network of caregivers is that we get the opportunity to meet people who, in most cases, we never would have met without our caregiving experience. And I and I know you certainly have a story of your own. But I, first of all, welcome. Second. Tell our, tell our listeners a little bit about you. We'll get into the book, but let our listeners know about Liz O'Donnell. Thank you for that. I um, was a working mother, primary breadwinner, stressed out marketing executive for the longest time. I thought my life was packed. And um, my parents were in their 80s and started to need more and more. And I thought I was this crazy working daughter caregiver. And then my my parents were diagnosed with terminal illnesses on the same day. And then I really became oh a family caregiver. So um, that was about 2014. It was right after my first book came out, Mogul Mom and Maid, about the challenges of working mothers. So mm. who am I? Um, <laughs> I was, I still am, uh, a, you know, a woman who... Um, cares deeply about the challenges women face in the workplace and mm -hmm. want to support them through my uh, favorite thing to do, which is writing and building community. And then, you know, I had, I was living what I was writing about and then my parents became sick and then I became obsessed with this concept of working daughters and how are we supporting women who had parents, not just women in the workplace who were parents. And um, then I became a spousal caregiver, and now I'm a single parent. And so I am, I guess, you know, just your average um, American care, uh, you know, family caregiver, a woman um, in her 50s, trying to figure it all out, who's on this continuum of care. Continuum of care. Goodness, that is so true. And, and of course, uh, it goes without saying that you've had quite a, uh, quite a few transitions uh, over the, the last few years. But there was one thing that you said that I, I guess I missed in your book. Your parents were diagnosed on the same day with terminal illnesses? Yeah. So in 2014, oh. I got a call from my sister. She had just hung up with my mother and she said, Mom's all stressed out. Dad doesn't seem right. She was out of state, so she said, can you go to them? And so my older sister and I went down, down, I say down because they lived on Cape Cod, and so we call mm -hmm. it down the Cape. So we went down to um, check on my parents, and that was June 14th and July 1st. And in between June 14th and July 1st, we admitted my dad to the hospital, and he was admitted to a psych ward, and my mom started to have stomach problems, and we admitted her into a 30-day respite program at assisted living because dad was in the hospital. Mom couldn't be alone. We had to get back to our jobs, and so it was this whirlwind couple of weeks that culminated on July 1st. I'll never forget. Uh, I was called in to have a family meeting with the team that was caring for my dad at the hospital, and they said it's dementia and Alzheimer's, and he should not go home. He should go into a memory care facility. Wow. By the way, you have a week to place him. It was, <laughs> we were going into the 4th of July weekend. Thanks. Um, I went out to the parking lot. I did a, a web conference call 
from my car with a client because uh, I was still trying. To, I, I never had any time to, to call work and say I need some days off. I was just sort of going and trying to figure it all out. I hung up with the client. I looked at my clock. I said, I can get to my daughter's basketball game. I haven't made any games yet in the summer league for obvious reasons. And my phone rang. My mom had been transferred to the hospital a couple of days before with those stomach pains I mentioned. And the doctor said, Liz, it's ovarian cancer. Can you come over now and we'll tell her together? Oh, goodness gracious, St. Ignatius. What a day that must have been. <laughs> it was a day. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so that just launched into... You know, I thought I had been a busy woman. That launched into, you know, some real busyness. Let's just Very say. much. You know, one of the areas that, um, that unfortunately, that I don't see talked enough about in caregiving is precisely what uh, what you're mentioning here, the sandwich generation. And you you certainly were, were getting at it both uh, from both sides, taking care of your, your parents, trying to raise your kids, work. It's hard. And if you're not, in, if you have not done it, you really can't grasp the the understanding of how difficult this can be. Yeah, there was a day when, so my first book had come out a few months before this incident, and there was a day when I had taken a vacation day from the day job because my mom wanted me to take her to the doctor. So I woke up before six so I could send some work emails. You know, even though it was a vacation day, you still have to, you know, finish your work and respond to your clients and get your teams all situated. And then I saw my kids go off to school and then I hopped in the car and drove the hour plus to go take my mother to the doctor. She was running late, so we missed the appointment. We pushed it back, you know, able to have it. Then you can't just take her to the doctor and say, okay, bye, you know, <laughs> right. spend some time with her, right? So we went to lunch, and then my dad said, can you help me with my computer? And then driving home, I had car trouble. I got home, and that night I was going to speak to a group of young mothers about my first book, which was about working mothers, mm. all about balance, which, you know, look <laughs> the hindsight, like, oh, the irony, right? The, the irony. Has a dry yes. sense of humor. And so now it's 11 o'clock at night, and I'm, you know, a day that started before six, and I was driving home, and I, this was my light bulb moment. I thought, everybody is trying to help working mothers, yes. as they should be. But mm -hmm. what about working daughters? Nobody is talking about this, and I don't know how to do this. And that was my aha moment. We all kind of get those aha moments at the most unusual time, and yours was at, at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, after after talking to a group of young mothers about just read my book and you too can be like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness, as you published your second book here, Working Daughters, I, I, a guide to caring aging parents while making a living. It is I, I just know from my own personal experience trying to balance work, life, and caregiving is one of the most impossible tasks that that anybody can can try to take on. Through your book, uh, you, you really give some terrific examples of how to balance life and work. Thank you. I think it's more of a mindset. And that's what I learned both through my going through my own experience and also writing the book. I think it's more of about getting in the right state of mind to be mm -hmm. able to do both. Mm -hmm. as opposed to any real specific tools. Now, having said that, don't get me wrong, I think companies need to step it up in the, you know, the benefits and the support they provide sure. caregivers. Our legislators need to step it up. You know, the medical industry needs to understand that caregivers are a part of the, of the, you know, the whole care team. And I think they are, but, but mostly I think it's about saying, okay, this is what I have to do. Can, you know, how, where can I really go full speed and where do I need to coast? What are my priorities and how am I going to get this done? Oh, and, and, and with the, also with the realization that, as much as you can map out your day, it could change at a moment's notice. And it's the most unpredictable situation I think we can find ourselves in. And that's what makes it challenging from a work perspective. Um, and I don't mean to keep comparing to parenting, mm -hmm. but I think that's the work-life issue we've been focused on in the workplace is, you know, how do we support workers who are parents? Now we really need to think about how do we also support workers who have parents? And it's a whole different set of it's issues. A whole different, right. One, yeah. One, it's not okay. I know that in 40 weeks, I'm going to take X amount of time off. And I expect to be back around this time. And, you know, I'm going to have daycare until 
they go to preschool and they'll be in school for a whopping three hours. So I have to figure out how the heck to make that work. And then they'll go to kindergarten for a whopping five hours. And then they'll be getting out at three. I mean, real challenges, right? Because the workplace wants you there till at least six. We don't know when we're going to get the phone call. We don't know how long a condition is. You know, we're living longer with chronic illnesses. We don't know what to expect. And we're not going home to a little bundle of joy that lifts us up. Exactly. You know, our workers are going home and they're they're administering medications, they're changing wounds, they're doing things that I don't think people understand and so it's it's a very different experience. And that's why I think it's so important. I'm pretty I'm I can feel pretty sure that you're going to agree with us that it why it's so important for for us to share our stories because I you know I I believe I personally believe it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to combat a common cause. And when we can share our stories as we feel comfortable, then not only can we touch other people, we we we, we give some understanding to somebody that may not have been down that road, but but are going to be. And, and especially in a working situation, I, I I always like to use the example of I may not have something in common with the top level executive, but if I had a conversation with with somebody in in a leadership role and found out that they were a caregiver, instantly we have a connection. We we could understand each other, but it's getting to that point to where you can feel comfortable to to exposing the stories to strangers. I absolutely agree with you. I think that's, I write, I think, for the same reasons other people exercise. It's how I work out my stress. It's how I, you know, think through my thoughts. And it's how I can um, connect with other people. And I think in our stories, there are so many universal themes. Your story with Richard and the Sun Sentinel. I was never married to Richard. I, you know, I, I don't live in Florida, but there were so many connection points there. And so the CEO in the corner office or the person who come and cleans the office at the end of the day or the whoever it might be, I think in telling our stories, there's always a universal theme. I mean, I think it's why for years I was addicted to stories about mountain climbing. I don't even want to climb a hill. You know, I'm never going to climb Everest, but in those stories of believing in something and overcoming things, there's always a universal thread for us. So I agree. And we don't talk about caregiving enough. We don't realize that other people are going through it and that we're not alone. We just feel alone. Isn't it that it's so amazing to think that AARP estimates that there's over 44 million family caregivers in the United States today. I happen to think that number is low. But uh, <laughs> mm. what, once, you, once you start as your role as a caregiver, you think you're the only one doing it. Now, yes. uh, I know that was true for me back in 2011 when Richard was first diagnosed. And I, I think you know, caregiving is, is now a little bit more in the, in the news per se. But mm-hmm. when you're when you're faced with it, when you get that, that call, like we both have received, that there's a terminal illness, you feel so alone. You don't know what to do because you've never been in that position before. You've never been in that position before. You've never heard anybody else talking about it. And there's no community that you're aware of. You know, again, back to because, you know, my background and focusing on the working parent originally There were mommy and me classes. People threw me a baby shower when I got pregnant. When I got the call that both of your parents are sick at the same time, you know, there was, I wasn't going to some group and singing and making friends around the experience. And nobody threw me a party and gave me gifts to help me through the experience. So, so how do you know that there are 43,999 others, right? Exactly. I might be repeating myself to you before in our previous conversations, but you know, I, I feel very blessed and to be able to to be an advocate for and to be able to share our story. But you know, along the lines in these past five years, I've not met one person that's had caregiving on their bucket list of things to do in life. I've not, <laughs> I've, not I've not met anybody that's prepared that uh, has thought that basically even thought thinks about it until it's right upon them. And that, uh, you know, I, I think it comes back to part of our conversation here is until we're faced with it, we really don't think about it. And then all of a sudden we're asked to do all these all these tasks that we're not prepared for or trained for. 
uh, in a moment's notice. And it, that, that's where a lot of the added stress comes. Yeah, I, we don't make space for it in our lives because, as you said, I don't think in any of our wildest dreams, or I just said to somebody recently, I don't think anybody puts this on their vision board. <laughs> oh, I so, like that. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so we don't make any space for it. And then all of a sudden you're cramming in the space and, and you just alluded to something. We don't have any training and we may be, you know, I don't think people who haven't been caregivers yet, but they will be, um, don't grasp that it's more than assisting with daily living tasks like bathing and errands and food. It's, you know, it can be you know, you need financial expertise, you need negotiation skills, and the medical tasks that we do, it's pretty, pretty uh, you, impressive. You're asked to do all these roles, like uh, as social worker, attorney, mm -hmm. nurse, uh, on, on top of everything else. It's kind of, it's kind of like having two relationships in one, that, that one relationship, whether it's a, a, a spouse or a sibling that was already there, and then that caregiving relationship comes in, because it, it does change a relationship. I hear that all the time, too, from um, the working daughters in the community, which is I just want to be a daughter again. Right. And I can't find the time and I can't figure out how to carve out the identity. So, you know, one, it's a matter of just time. If I can only go check on my parents every Saturday and I'm running errands for them and helping them with you know chores around the house, then I haven't just gone and visited with my parents. I can't be the daughter, too. Or I don't know how to play this role where – they are now leaning on me for support and mm -hmm. I'm having this adult to adult relationship. The dynamic has shifted. I just don't know what that looks like. Yeah, those role reversals, parenting my parents, I, always comes to mind. And I, I didn't, that was never a part of uh, my experience. Uh, my parents uh, passed on when I was fairly young, in my 20s, but they didn't need the care that some folks uh, mm -hmm. that we know have had to put in like yourself. And it, uh, their transition happened pretty quickly. And, and I, I can only imagine what, what that must be like for for a daughter or a son who has to really play that role. Yeah. I actually don't like that concept of parenting the parent or I've become yeah. the parent. I, under, I understand where it comes from. However, I, what I challenge caregivers to think about is can you find a new reality, one that maybe like you know, that. isn't in your, in your definition. Mm -hmm. So we had, you know, we were, we had a child adult relationship with our parents. And then if I say, if you're lucky, cause not everybody can make that shift, but then you have an adult adult relationship with your parents, hopefully. Um, and then there's a third realm that I don't necessarily know how to describe, but it's two adults sort of helping uh, each other out, you know, as opposed good. to the shift. Yeah. Yeah. And I read the book, I don't know if you, I'm sure you read it, by Atul Gawande being mortal. Oh, and yes. For me, it was, yeah, I love that book. It was that book that, the, the, what clicked for me in that book was this concept of autonomy versus safety. And I think as children caregiver, you know, caregivers of our parents were so concerned about their safety but they mm. might fall, but they might leave the oven on. So how, you know, I can't let them stay in their home, whatever it might be. Right. But they, you know, assuming there's no cognitive decline, they get to make choices. They're still adults. It's yeah. their lives. And it might be inconvenient for us because it stresses us out. One example is, so my parents, you know, lived an hour away. They were on Cape Cod. Their house is not in a very, you know, they can't walk to anything. It's not a commercial mm. area. It's pretty mm. isolated in the winter. When there were major snowstorms, I wanted them to come up and stay at my house, and they didn't want to, and it would really, you know, annoy me because <laughs> I needed them to be safe, and that was that was it. Right. It was I needed them to be safe because I needed to focus on work during the snowstorm. I needed to feel good that they were Very okay. Good. It wasn't about what they needed. Oh, God. <laughs> you put that so eloquently. Goodness, because you. It, it, I'm thinking back to the times now with Richard of thing, the things that I needed that he didn't want to do. Oh, I had not <laughs> yeah. thought about it like that. Well, thank you for that. Oh, well, I didn't put it eloquently then. I yelled at them, you know. <laughs> in hindsight, I, in it's, hindsight, oh, I'm so um, thoughtful. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> so I, I guess... One of the things that I, I wanted to ask you, and I, I I find caregiving to be kind of the equalizer. It has, there's no gender boundaries, there's no orientation boundaries. There's, 
know, there might be some differences culturally. When it comes to mm-hmm. it, uh, we really all connect without even knowing each other. One of the really important parts of your book is that it's really for everybody. It's not just for working daughters. That's definitely my hope. My hope is that, and it's back to what we were talking about in, in the connection through storytelling, is mm-hmm. that some of the themes and the experiences and the takeaways are universal, even for non-caregivers, you know, never mind for female versus male caregivers. Right. I personally focus on women because one, it was the audience I was always already writing for. Mm-hmm. Um, but two, and, and I, I agree with you, caregivers are caregivers. We have, you know, we have different circumstances, but similar um, situations, if that makes any sense, similar, mm-hmm. you know, there are a lot of common threads where I think there's a difference is in the workplace and women have historically had yes. challenges in the workplace because we haven't been in the workplace, you know, that long, if you mm. look at it historically. Yes. So we're still figuring out how to balance both partners in a household going to work. We're still figuring out how to take time off from maternity versus paternity leave. We still might not be getting paid the same, um, you know, amount on the hour that a man is for the same amount of work. So women have these challenges in the workplace and then you throw the caregiving mix in and oftentimes your elder care experience is compounded by your child care experience and yes. you might have already lost some pay and you're looking at living a long life. Women are expected to live a little bit longer than men. Um, how are you going to pay for that? And if you're already not earning what you should be earning and if you're not earning what you should be earning, then you're not saving for retirement. So there's not just a pay gap, there's a retirement gap, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason I focused on daughters specifically, although I hope the message resonates for sons, is we really need to get our heads around how we stay at work because we need to stay at work. Oh, very much so. And I, and I think the I think it does resonate with uh, with sons as well because, and, and and here's 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 my point with that is we need to bring these issues out into the forefront and. And from my experience, men don't uh, self-identify as caregivers. Heard that, yeah. Yeah, and I think as we bring these stories to the forefront, and and you describing from your your, your experience as, as a woman, as a working as a working daughter, I'm hopeful that it will allow people to feel more comfortable in looking internally at their situation and being open to talking about what's going on in their lives because. The only way we're going to make change is for us to be on the forefront and and talk about our experiences. Because how can how can we know to make a change if we don't know what's exactly going on? Right, and men have unique challenges around caregiving too at work. Um, you know, there are still workplaces where a man takes time off or leaves early or comes in late because he has a family obligation, and he gets a big attaboy because oh, you know. It's unique to see a man in this in certain corporate cultures, you know, do prioritize family. And then there are other corporate cultures where, um, you know, they might say, "Add a boy, look at that guy. He prioritizes his family." You know, like it's something unique that women haven't been doing. Um, right. But behind his, <laughs> but behind his back, they're like, "Oh, he doesn't have the killer instinct." You know, we're all in. So, so there are gender. You, I think there are some uniquenesses from a gender perspective there. in the workplace. But back to your point, the more we all talk about it and normalize it, the better for better all is. of us. And, I, and I'm very thankful for my four, four older sisters who gave me my care gene. So I had to, I had to get a plug in for my <laughs> sisters. <so. laughs> well, Liz, Always I talk, important to plug the siblings. You got that right. <laughs> and my brother, too. I better throw that in there, too. Uh, <laughs> Liz, I could talk to you forever, and and but we just have a couple of minutes left in the final podcast of uh, Healing Ties. I certainly will invite you to be on the new podcast, Aging Gayfully. That would be fun to have you on and continue our story sharing. But um, let our listeners know how they can find you on the internet, purchase your book, all that great contact information that you that you'd like to share with our listeners. I would be happy to, but first, I'm honored to be on your last show. I've loved it over the years, so thank you. Thank you. And you can find me um, easy enough. The website is workingdaughter.com. The Facebook community is Working Daughter. And the book is Working Daughter, A Guide to Caring for Your Aging Parents While Making a Living. And that is available on Amazon. 
on Amazon, and I will have a link on the Whole Care Network available for uh, for our listeners to uh, to find uh, Liz as well. Liz, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, for joining me today. Thank you. Okay, well, goodness gracious, Saint Ignatius, that does it for not only this episode of Healing Ties, but I'm Chris McClellan, the Bowtie Guy. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends through radio writing, travel, advocacy, and being with awesome people like Liz O'Donnell. Healing Ties is a part of the Whole Care Network. Check us out online at thewholecarenetwork.com. Thanks for listening to Healing Ties. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.